A very good evening and welcome to our special series, The State of Our Nation. I'm your host. My name is Vuyo Mvogo. Now, in news just in, ANC Deputy Secretary General Jesse Duarte has lashed out at trade union AMCU, as well as political party, the Economic Freedom Fighters, saying their coming into existence has the potential to destabilize the country's economy. Duarte didn't spare some of the ANC's allies either. She berated NUMSA and the NUM. Duarte was addressing a conference of the NUM in Johannesburg. Workers must also act in unity to prevent bosses from succeeding in union bashing activities. The most recent example is that of lawnman activity, favoring AMCU in an attempt to destabilize the NUM, COSATU and the ANC. This was not only an attack on the, on the NUM comrades, it was also an attack on the unity of COSATU, and in our view, it was an attack on our movement, which includes the leader of the alliance, the ANC. This is part of an anti-majoritarian, liberal offensive to break the hegemony of our movement, and such destabilization gives further impetus to counter-revolutionary forces. The arrival of AMCU with its anarchic characteristics and the formation of the EFF who show similar characteristics are perhaps not coincidental. The involvement of Swedish syndicalists as well as the experiments being conducted by ultra-leftists both within and outside our own organization is a resurgence of the workerist tendencies that were already defeated by COSATU in the 1980s. One should therefore not be surprised to find EFF leaders such as Dalian Porfu and Swedish consultants advising AMCU. These forces are working together to destabilize the economy and the ANC-led government. AMCU, in our view, made unrealistic demands in the platinum belt and no capacity to sustain and support workers and their families. During the pro prolonged strike, and at best gained a hollow, and we call it a Pyrrhic victory where no one wins, there are already indications that mine bosses will be closing shafts and retrenching workers to offset the loss of production and higher wages. This will only cause further distress to already ravaged communities. AMCO and its allies are currently trying to organize at Sun City. We heard this last night. Where they are making extraordinary promises to workers. The ANC fully supports the right of workers to join any union. And we agree that workers must earn decent and living wages. However, where charlatans use the legitimate demands of the poor and vulnerable to destabilize the economy and the country, we have to intervene. The NUM I see now has grown, and I would like to congratulate it, but it has also shrunk in recent times. And we have to ask ourselves why. It cannot simply be because AMCU has had support from certain mine bosses in the past or because other COSATU affiliates such as NUMSA are poaching. A very real consideration is also that the workers who joined AMCU or NUMSA left the MUM may have been dis dissatisfied with the service that they were getting from the NUM. Jesse Duarte, a short while ago. Well, still staying with the news, the top stories of the day. At least one major car manufacturer is under pressure from its overseas parent company to relocate its operation while other metals and engineering companies have come under enormous pressure to retrench. That's at least according to the head of the biggest group of employers affected by the NUMSA strike that started yesterday. SIFSA CEO Kaiser Nyatsumba was talking to our economic senior reporter, Francis Heard, a couple of hours ago. I spoke to NUMSA yesterday. They denied uh, that workers tried to, to storm your offices, but there were some reports yesterday of, of vandalism. What, what have you seen and heard? Well, I received from uh, uh, COSATU General Secretary 
Zuelin Zimavavi and the president of NUMSA, uh, the memorandum was handed over to me. We spent quite some time with them. So there was no incident outside of our offices in downtown Johannesburg. But I must tell you that we're very, very worried about what happened today at various workplaces. A very number of our members indicating that there, was, there were acts of vandalism. People have broken down gates, they've uh, walked into factory floors, and have taken things, including tools, away. Mm. So we have a, a growing number of such inc instances uh, reported to us, and we're very concerned. And of course, we have each one of them reported to the police, and we're hoping that action will be taken. You, you've raised concern today about the economic damage, about the 300 million. Uh, from, from your part, from the employer's part, did you do everything you could to prevent this, this strike? Was there movement on, on wage offers, at least? Well, we most certainly did everything that we could have done. We, we said from the beginning, when negotiations started just over three months ago, that we wanted to ensure that everything possible is done to avoid a strike in this round of wage negotiations. And so when we eventually tabled an offer, it was tabled on a day when the consumer price index was 6.1%, and that's what we offered, which was inflation related. And uh, the unions, NUMSA and, and four of the six unions came in with a 15% demand as per the mandate given to them by their members. Over time, they had to consolidate the union demands, and instead of moving downwards, they moved upwards. They moved from 15% to 20% and stayed there for a long time. Mm. We eventually moved to what we consider is a, prop, is, is a proper settlement zone, 7% for higher-earning artisans and 8% for lower-earning workers, at a time when the consumer price uh, index is, is at 6.6%. Can I ask you, is it fair, though, because it's 6.6%, but we know that, that lower-earning workers feel inflation much more. They have a different inflation rate. We know that costs are, are going up across our economy. Um, so, so you're sticking very close to inflation inflation, but there is this argument uh, that it should be higher. Well, uh, the context is the following. Our economy has been bleeding badly. South Africa is not an island. We coexist with many other countries around the world. We have a flood of imports into our economy, and the things that are brought here that we manufacture are sold at a price cheaper than we can sell them for. So our economy has not been doing well. Manufacturing in South Africa has not been doing well. And the metals and engineering sector, since two, the, the recession globally in 2008, has not recovered. So we have been shedding jobs. Mm. We have companies right now that are, in fact, considering downsizing even before the negotiations began. Our economy in the first three months of, of 2014 shrunk by 0.6%. We have been, as a country, downgraded by standards and poor's from uh, triple B to triple B minus, which is just a notch above junk status. And by Fitch, from uh, uh, an, an economic outlook of positive to negative. That is the context. Mm -hmm. We don't negotiate wages in a void. You've got to take all of that context in, 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 into consideration. And so that's what mm -hmm. informing, informing our approach. A and I'm sure you're worried about productivity as well. That's always raised. You, you know, certainly. people have to um, earn what they get. But, but is, is there room for creativity? Uh, were you and, and the other employers' bodies, uh, NIASA, looking for ways to, to motivate workers and, and tie productivity, maybe give them more, but, but you get that as well? Well, there certainly is room for productivity. We came to the negotiations with a whole host of uh, proposals. Uh, regrettably, so far, we have not been able to find one another uh, between ourselves and Labour. Tell me what's happening now, because there's a, a meeting with the Labour Minister tomorrow, I understand. Is, is that the only negotiations are going on, or are there other attempts to, to get the parties We remain together? committed to doing everything possible to resolve the strike. So we are available to engage with all stakeholders, the different unions in, in, in included. I met the General Secretary of Solidarity on Monday, and on Monday we had a meeting of our council. It's made up of the chairpersons of our respective uh, employer associations. After that meeting, we then meet, met with the Minister of Labor. Uh, she met with us and met with NUMSA and met with uh, uh, the, the, the two uh, delegations. There isn't a meeting scheduled with the Minister tomorrow. There is likely to be one on Friday. But what we do have as CIFSA tomorrow is a meeting of our council yet again to look at whether or not there is a possibility for some movement to help ensure that we reach a settlement. After that meeting, we have a meeting in the evening with the leadership of NUMSA, where we'll be able to indicate where we then stand. We would certainly hope that they too will have made some movement from where they stand now at 12%, so that we are able to find 
each other. Uh, okay, so hopefully something happens tomorrow. Do you believe, like many have predicted, this could be um, a short-term strike? If not, I, I want to ask you, how will we start feeling it, presumably in, in exports? And, and I think because these are consumer-facing companies, a lot of people don't know what we're talking about when we talk about steel and engineering. What's being made? What's being exported? Um, how will this uh, affect us? We certainly do hope that it will be possible in the course of the week to conclude a deal that returns employees to their workplaces because the metals and engineering sector needs that, the, the manufacturing sector in the country needs that, but more importantly our country requires that. A prolonged strike would wreak much more damage on the economy than we need. We might then have a second term uh, in which we have a negative growth and then we find ourselves as a country in a recessionary situation. So uh, we would certainly hope that it is possible to reach an agreement. Now the metals and engineering sector is a very strategic one. It is a supplier on the downstream side to the mining sector. It is a supplier on the upstream side to the auto manufacturing uh, industry as well as to the construction industries. So it means that the platinum sector has just come out of a strike. It has affected us because it meant that our products that we sell to the mining companies were not being sold because there, there was not work uh, happening there. But it also means that when there is work happening in the mining sector, we might not be able in the next few days to supply the products that we need to supply. The same vehicle manufacturing in this country might also grind to a halt. And we have, I've had in fact, a CEO of a major multinational company resident here that has said it is, uh, he is under considerable uh, pressure from his head office to relocate from South Africa because we are strike prone as a country. So our country is not painted in a good way. We are then abroad seen as a, 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 an investment destination that is not investment friendly, that is uh, characterized by strikes at all times. All right, so a very worrying situation. Thank you very much for your time this evening. That was the CEO of the Steel and Engineering Industries Federation of South Africa, Kaiser Nyansumba. Well, Metal Workers Union NUMSA, meanwhile, has threatened to shut down ESCOM operations by pulling out all its members from the power utility. That's if the company takes action against NUMSA members who have heeded calls to strike. ESCOM yesterday obtained a court interdict barring its workers from going on strike. A small number of NUMSA members held a picket outside the ESCOM headquarters at Sunning Hill, north of Johannesburg today. This in defiance of a court interdict declaring their action illegal. Workers are demanding higher salary increases. It was a similar picture in Limpopo. About 200 NUMSA members gathered outside the Midupi power station in Lepalale. The power utility says it will take steps against striking workers. ESCOM is considered an essential service and its workers are barred from striking. We have uh, informed all our employees that in terms of the uh, interdict granted by the Labour Court yesterday that uh, industrial action is illegal and will not be tolerated. So unfortunately we will be taking disciplinary action against uh, any of our employees who have taken part in uh, a picket outside of, uh, you know, with, with the, or within their working hours, uh, unfortunately. But uh, that's where we are. We'll count numbers at the end of the day. Wage talks between ESCOM and NUMSA have deadlocked. It's believed ESCOM is offering 5.6%, while NUMSA is demanding a 12% hike. I'm not afraid of ESCOM. We are here to fight for our rights. Everything has gone up, petrol up, it tolls and everything is up. But we have been given a pittance. Why shouldn't we fight when we are given pittance? 5.6 is nothing, it's penis. Like last night, some of the things have increased. NUMSA has vowed to fight ESCOM if it takes action against its members. For 340,000 workers, that we might pull out if ESCOM takes any, any, any action against them. And we're prepared to do that. We're prepared to pull our members all over the country and make sure that we protect these workers. NUMSA has also embarked on an indefinite strike in the metal and engineering sector. And tensions ran high in Richards Bay on the KwaZulu-Natal north coast today. That's as hundreds of NUMSA members tried to force others to join their strike action. Meanwhile, Finance Minister Ntlantanene has again expressed concern about the current wave of strikes and their impact on the economy. The strikes are expected to affect revenue collection, which is expected to reach 1 trillion rand in the current tax year. Liuta Matlokhelo, SABC News, Johannesburg.
we, you ask? This is who we are. We are technologically driven. We are unashamedly Afrocentric. We advise you not only on legal matters, but on health issues as well. We bring imagination to life. We celebrate arts and culture and lifestyle. We tackle life challenges head on. We dig deep. We probe. We question. We invite you to take a view from our house. As we tell it without fear, separating fiction from factual. We are the SABC News Channel. All news, all global, all the time. SABC News, we've got Africa covered. Welcome back, and if you've just joined us, good evening and welcome to our special series the state of our nation. This is where we look at some of the big issues happening in our provincial legislatures while keeping you up to date with some of the major stories of the day. Now, our focus province for this evening is Gauteng, where today, Premier David Makura responded to political parties' concerns and criticisms of his state of the nation address delivered last week. We caught up with him immediately afterwards. Premier, thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Well, let me start with um, the hot one, e-tolls. Now, there's obviously this panel that's going to look into um, this, this, this whole thing. But the question I want to ask is, are you not perhaps raising people's expectations about something that perhaps for all intents and purposes is a foregone conclusion? having seen the sort of uh, arguments that national government has made in the past. The, the panel will review uh, the socio-economic impact of uh, it all, the, the impact on the economy of the province, the impact on uh, uh, many people who use uh, their own private vehicles, not because they would love to, but because we are in the state of rolling out uh, public uh, transport infrastructure. And we, we, we have a vision that there will be time in this province that uh, you and I would not have to use our private vehicles to get around to work, uh, those who are in business, to get to do business. Uh, and we are putting tremendous effort to roll out this public transport uh, infrastructure as rapidly as possible. Uh, in the meantime, anyone who thinks that it is not a problem li lives in another world. Uh, so we, we are essentially uh, rising to the occasion to acknowledge that this is a matter that, that is a sore point, affects uh, people. It has been raised in various platforms. As the premier of the province, I can't uh, close my ears and eyes to it, as I said, in the state of the province address. I come to the issue of e tolls from the point of view of investment in good public infrastructure, including economic infrastructure that will enhance the uh, economic development of the province. I can't say with honesty uh, that uh, you know, the e tolls is just a small problem. I know it is a, it's an issue. Even those who don't have cars see it as, as an important issue. So we are reviewing the panel. Uh, you asked the question, uh, will this uh, raise expectations? I've said to people they must continue to pay. I've said to people we don't want to promise easy solutions and easy claim easy victories. Uh, and, but I, you know, I am, I am the, the, the public representative of this province, the head of government in the province. I can't close my eyes to the fact that this is an, an important issue. Do you have any we will engage with national government uh, when the review has been done because it must be based on science. It mustn't be based on, on just gut feel or sentiment. We must 
do you have any assess thoughts? the full impact. Do you have any thoughts, though, Premier, as to how we can perhaps find, shall we call them, creative ways of paying for each other? Any thoughts? No, I don't want to preempt the work that's going to be done by the review panel. I hear people say, what about this, what about that, what about that? Uh, the review panel will submit a report to me. You know, I'll, announce, the... I'll announce it next, the panel next week. I'll put a panel that will do that, that, that will do a full review, submit a report. I'll be able to engage our, our, our national leadership, uh, national cabinet, the Minister of Transport, the President. We, we, we are all under the guidance of uh, President Zuma. Uh, but this matter that the ETOLs uh, are a factor in Gauteng, it's not, no one can dispute that. No, just from what you've picked up, from the thoughts, the ideas, the suggestions that have been made, any, that sort of <laughs> caught your attention? <laughs> it's too early. <laughs> it's let's too move early. on then, Premier, to talk about uh, building the economy. You made, uh, I mean, significant pronouncements yes. on rebuilding yes. the townships, yes. the economy of the yes. townships. Um, but how, given um, just, I mean, we've been 20 years into this democracy yes. and nothing of the scale that you're suggesting has even been attempted in the, in the, in the, in the, in the past. Where do you even begin? And, and that is why we talk uh, in the ANC, which is the governing party here in Gauteng, in the whole country, we talk about radical socioeconomic transformation. We want to do things we haven't done in 20 years. And the reason we should do this, the NDP also talks about it. If we don't think boldly outside the box, if we just do what we have done over the past 20 years, uh, f firstly, we will not uh, transform this economy. You, significant number of black people are outside the mainstream of the economy, either through employment as well as through meaningful participation like ownership, you know, enterprises, SMMEs. So, and secondly, if we don't do this, the apartheid spatial landscape will remain the same. And, and what shall we do to our own, uh, say to our own souls uh, and to future generations if we did not change, radically change the spatial landscape of apartheid? Black people can't be in the, out, in the outskirts of cities, on the margins of cities, far from economic opportunities where they spend lots of money between home and work, uh, where there's no public transport nodes. Uh, so, so first, just by conviction, it is the right thing to do to, to introduce large scale, unprecedented interventions to change the economy. Just on the township economy, we are very convinced that, uh, in fact, one of the most decisive ways through which we can tackle unemployment and poverty is to bring township, is to make townships, apartheid designs townships as labor reserves, dormitories where people go to sleep. Uh, they provide labor in the white economy. And then after that, they go and sleep uh, on the margins of that white economy, white cities. We will work with the township, communi our communities in the townships to, the, to, to revive, revitalize, uh, community enterprises. I mean, you and I know, um, you know, in the, in the early 80s, uh, the township economies were thriving. They were, they were, they were corner shops, puzzle shops. Today, those shops are either occupied by foreign business people, and the township people, most of them, just happy with, if I used to own a shop, that shop is uh, rented to somebody else, they pay them rent. But we also, we have, we have been saying, but why is it like that? Uh, so you need, government has got uh, resources, procurement power, uh, which we are saying part of this must be redirected into the townships. And we make simple examples. Township people produce bread, which is not, that bread is not, is not taken into the school nutrition program that we have in schools in the townships. 
They buy, where do they buy their bread? From Albany and Sasko. These are big companies, baked somewhere else, transported to the townships. Why can't the township people bake their bread locally and put, apart from taking it into the local shops, take that bread, provide it to the hospital. Hospitals are government institutions that, that consume bread, consume vegetables. We want township people to provide uh, the food, uh, the <coughs> other, the furniture, and I have seen township people producing good quality furniture. What we must do, which we will do in the next uh, f few months, Vuyo, will be, we, we will be going into every township. Firstly, we are building township hubs where all business people, entrepreneurs in an area come together. They mustn't compete amongst themselves. They must look into their own niches. Uh, government will bring training. We will bring support uh, of, for these entrepreneurs. In some instances, funding, because some of them do, do need funding. And in other areas, we will also provide the markets. We will provide off-take agreements. Uh, the second area I give an example of all the time is school uniforms. We, we you know, we, we are government. This government, we have no fee-paying schools. Schools that government is really supporting poor families, poor households, the learners from poor households are getting everything there. Where do we get this, this, this uniform? It must be made by the women in the townships uh, through their own township enterprises, and we buy the uniform. By so doing, every, you know, every year we, buy the, we can buy the shoes. We, can buy, we have two million learners in Houghton schools. Uh, we, we, so we, we have the muscle, the economic muscle, that we can use to reinforce the effort of township uh, com uh, enterprises, community enterprises. Uh, in that way, we will have much more people. Instead of unemployment will be something of the past. We will have more people, instead of waiting for, for a, a big company to open uh, and therefore employ another thousand people, we can address unemployment and poverty uh, from a different perspective. That's transformative for here's, us. Here's one of your biggest challenges, Prime. Yes. It is that with every year that passes, we have more and more people coming to Gauteng. Yes. Now, over the past 20 years, we haven't been able, in other words, what we are proposing now is, uh, what we are proposing to do now is something that hasn't been done yes. in the past 20 years, and yes. certainly not to the escape, to, not to the scale yes, I agree. that you are envisaging. Yes. And the more you try to address that problem, more and more people are coming to Gauteng because yes. they see Gauteng as the place of opportunities. How do yeah. you deal with that? Because urbanization. It's not gonna, in my view, narrow. Rapid urbanization is a big challenge. Uh, but urbanization is a challenge all over the world. The cities all over the world, the, the big cities or city regions uh, or thriving economic uh, regions all over the world are attracting more people from the countryside. It's, our, it's a reality. We can't stop people from coming to cities. Uh, in, in our country, I think uh, we believe that uh, the intervention of infrastructure investments, particularly in rural areas, driven by President Zuma will help to revitalize the rural economies. Uh, but as far as uh, I know, people are not going to stop uh, tomorrow from coming to Houghton. The more we do well in education, there will be more learners coming from the rest of the country, brought here by their parents uh, to come and study here. Healthcare is also under pressure. Housing delivery is also under pressure. But that, it is for that reason also that we are saying, you know, instead of thinking that the, the big economy, jobs are going to be provided only in the big economy. We have 12.5 million people in Houghton communities. Where are they? In the old townships, in the informal settlements. What can we do to make this thriving uh, uh, economic hubs? And we, we're saying that the informal sector will play a critical role. That's why in Johannesburg we've been worried when there's a conflict and tension between the informal traders in the city and the city of, uh, officials, the city authorities, the same in Swan. Because a lot of people who come to Gauteng, you and I know, 
uh, having, having, having been born in the, the northern province then, which is Limpopo, people come to the cities, people come to Gauteng because they are looking for opportunities. Uh, it's a gener generations over generations, people have always been coming here. But my father came to, to Jamiston in the 1940s because the economy at the time was different. He came to work here. Uh, they worked for big factories because of the growth of the manufacturing sector in the 1940s. We cannot build this uh, new economy on the, mod on the same model. Uh, we, we have to find, that's why we talk about township enterprises. SMMEs is the way to go. Any economy, big economy in the world has been only been able to tackle unemployment through small enterprises, micro enterprises. And in our case, we emphasize township enterprises, which are cooperatives and collectives of people who would look at the gap in the, in, the, in the township economy. There's these goods and services that they can provide. All they need is support from government. So you are right, you are right. This is something that hasn't been done. But there are parts of the world where it has been very, very successful. I've seen township enterprises in China, for example, that the local economy is, can be self-sufficient. But in, you the don't need a in the townships, Premier, it's not that simple either. Because you have nationals from other countries all over the continent yes. who are not welcome and who are doing well. Instead of us learning from them what they are doing right in trying to revive those corner yes. shops, we are chasing them away, even killing them. Yes. I, I certainly agree. I mean, one of the things that we must really <laughs> learn from the, the Somali and Pakistani traders who are a lot uh, doing <laughs> lots of work in the townships is they, they are clever business people. They, 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 they buy in bulk and supply so that they can deal with the issue of price. You know, buying and selling price, the price mechanism, it's a very, very important. What influenced township people to go and buy in a shop of a, run by a foreigner? People, when people buy, it depends on buying power. They don't care who really is the owner of the shop. They want to buy their bread cheaper. They want to buy their milk cheaper. So what should township entrepreneurs learn is, that's why we, we encourage cooperatives and at di different levels, organize the, the, the entrepreneurs and the business, the small SMMEs must be organized to can leverage buying power. And when they are organized, it's better for us. When government wants to support organized business people, small uh, entrepreneurs uh, and enterprises that can pool in one area of a service or, or goods, that can pool their resources together, it makes it easy for us to support them. And I'm saying it's true. We should learn from uh, this business-minded uh, uh, entrepreneurs who may not be South Africans on how do they make it and, and it's, it's pulling the resources together, but buy also, in bulk. But also leadership, Premier, because um, we haven't seen the sort of high-level leadership yes, yes. shown yes. by political leaders, yes. but also business leaders, I suppose, but more so political leaders who are speaking out against the phenomenon of chasing these people away and killing yes. them. We haven't seen that. Yeah, certainly. I mean, we, we, you know, a province like Gauteng is a province, uh, is a place for all. <laughs> this is a cosmopolitan province. It's a, it's a cultural melting pot for Africa, for the rest of the country. And even people from all over the world, we, we want to attract the best entrepreneurs here. They must come here to create businesses here, as long as they come lawfully, as long as they pay tax. You know, they, 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 we want to attract the best, uh, the best professionals from all over the country, <coughs> all over the world. They must come here, bring skills, because when they bring entrepreneurship, they bring skills, they bring capital here. That, that can only grow our economy. We want to break the, what we call the, we want to break the back of monopoly capital, the old structure of the structure of the South African economy, where you have dominant big companies that are essentially white, white owned companies that are dominating our economy. We must break with that. We, but there's different ways of doing so. We, we have to insist on on, uh, on, on empowerment in every sector, but we must also bring in uh, the township 
uh, enterprises, SMMEs in, in the big way. We also want uh, a big business to support township enterprises, you know, supplier development, they must procure from them, not just government. And we, we say to them that it's in their interest that this economy is bigger than just what it is today, uh, that, that it is in the interest of big business that township small enterprises are supported by them. And, and you know, we, I have seen in Soweto where someone is producing furniture from their house, good quality furniture. It may not be where it should be. We must help them to comply. They must have a license uh, to, do, to work in, in their home. We must help them to register their business. Uh, in some instances, we know small enterprises don't pay the tax that the others do. We must also help them to improve the quality of their goods and services. I want to see the furniture that is in this legislature, in the government office, in the premier's office, coming from a township enterprise. And the township enterprises must be assisted to produce the quality that they can also export. The Premier, the, the, the government at all levels, national government, provincial uh, government level, at local government, has been doing all manner of things in order to try and address this problem in exactly the way you're saying it. Um, BEE, encouraging like preferential procurement, but none of them have, have, have worked. So what's going to be different this time around? Um, what I can tell you is that uh, we, we, we are doing more than we talk. Uh, that's, that's one of the things that, that we have recognized as a country. Uh, we have the best policies, but we implement very little of that. I, I, I think President Zuma, uh, second administration, which is the fifth administration, uh, what runs through the national government, which is also uh, cascading in the provinces, and I'm doing the same here in Kauteng, is that we must spend more time implementing our plans rather than sitting in boardrooms going through paper when we are not on the ground. So I, I, I can assure you that in the next 200 days, by the time of the next state of the province address, I'm going to be able to demonstrate how much we have gone to townships to support enterprises in all areas of the economy. Jessica the Hippo was found after she was washed down the river shortly after birth. Today, she is a large hippo and still returns for feeding and human interaction. She also loves um, body exfoliating. She has a mask as well. Jessica is the world's most famous hippo, and perhaps she's the only one who has forgotten how aggressive she's supposed to be. That's Kaleidoscope, Sundays, 5.30 p.m. on SABC News. Across the globe, the continent, and the entire country, every second, there's always a breaking story. SABC News is your reliable eye, ear, and information system in bringing you events as they happen. Our cutting-edge and hard-hitting journalism leaves no stone unturned, giving you the whole picture every time. Join us every day on SABC2 and know what is happening around you. SABC News, Africa's news leader. Welcome back. You're watching the state of our nation and we're bringing you a second installment now of that interview with the premier of Gauteng, Mr. David Makura. Here he talks about service delivery and other issues. We will de definitely be engaging uh, the, the trade unions as well. We need that partnership with the trade unions. Uh, there's no way we can move our economy forward without the trade unions, uh, in the same vein that we need the partnership with business. Uh, but uh, you and I would know, Vuyo, that the, in the history of this country, is uh, this country was built on the basis of cheap labor, black 
black labor. What I wouldn't want uh, in an economy like ours, this, the fourth biggest economy in the continent and the, the largest economy in our country, I wouldn't want to promote cheap labor. Uh, you know, we, because of the full implications of what it means, we should build an economy that, that where you know, workers are, are rewarded meaningfully for the work they do, to, for us to achieve productivity. You know, uh, people who wake up uh, to go to work must come back home feeling uh, fulfilled. But if you pay, uh, you know, wages that are you know, peanut wages, uh, if people earn only enough to come back to work, but uh, by the by the time they earn, that money is already committed to to the rest of the month, carrying them to go to work. You will have major problems in, in an economy. You will have employees that are not very, very happy. So I, I have been saying to business people, they should understand the notion of decent employment. Uh, we, we should build an economy where uh, uh, you know, people are rewarded uh, uh, decent. We know business is about uh, profit. Uh, but I, I certainly, um, I mean, I, my trade union experience and, and my own consciousness tells me that there's something wrong with a sweatshop, sweatshop economy where people are, are grossly exploited. Uh, workers are, are, are you know, uh, what the trade unions call uh, uh, labor brokers. Uh, somebody just organizes workers and they pocket the rest of the money. And these workers have no no benefits. I don't think we should build an economy like that. Uh, our economy is big enough. Our, as, uh, this country has in resources where we can, we can build an economy that uh, is uh, built on the basis of decent employment. Uh, and business can still make a profit. And that's, that's my emphasis. It doesn't mean there may not be issues that have to do with labor laws. But we should, given where we come from as a country, you know, colonialism, apartheid. Uh, this Gauteng was built by mine workers who were earning nothing. I wouldn't want to support a situation where black, black workers in particular and workers in general are grossly exploited. I would want a situation where, you know, we build an economy, green, smart economy, uh, essentially thriving industries. Uh, where workers get decent wages, they get decent benefits to look after their families. It is, it is good for, uh, for the country that uh, workers are able to look after their families. They are able to take their children to the, to the bed schools and provide the, for, their, for their families. That, that, I think, is important. And I have found out that business people understand it. We can't build a, a labor force that has no rights. Workers must have rights. But if you ask me, are there problems with the, uh, the way these rights are being exercised? Yes, I think the best example is in the mining industry. Uh, you can't, those rights are not meant to destroy the economy. Uh, those rights are not meant to destroy businesses. Uh, workers cannot be involved in indefinite strike action. Uh, it's not in their best interest. We can't destroy the economy and still think that uh, we need employment. So there are issues, certainly, that I know the president and deputy president are dealing with uh, uh, very closely. The, the last issue I want us to talk uh, about uh, very, very briefly. Now, you've set up a, shall we call it a war room, um, that's going to deal in large part with service delivery. Uh, take us through why you want to do that and what for you is the biggest uh, problem facing service delivery in Gauteng? You know, when we assumed office on the 21st of, uh, of May, uh, we identified that one of the key challenges that have plagued the province is uh, protests. Uh, you know, some of them quite violent. Uh, I've been on the ground many, many times. Uh, as you know, I spent uh, 14 years in the uh, leadership of the party here. Uh, I've been in many areas where the people raise genuine concerns about something is not working. You know, there's a best water pipe. The uh, sewer is overflowing. They've reported the matter to the relevant authority, provincial or local government department. Nobody has been coming. 
I found that a lot of the things that communities complain about are genuine issues. Uh, of course, there's a problem. There's uh, always elements that use violence, and we condemn violence. Uh, but protests are not a problem by their nature. So the reason I've played service delivery at the center of what we will do, including how government interacts with communities, is, is because of that experience. There's a lot of things we can sort out without people uh, uh, coming out in the like? street. Uh, I was giving you an example. People phone and say to me, there's a best pipe. Uh, we have been phoning, or there's an electricity cut. Uh, for one reason or the other, the, the, or water cut, uh, we have reported the matter. No one is doing anything about it. Over the last few days, what I've been doing, because I've appointed a special advisor on service delivery, who's going to be the main, the main man in charge of the service delivery war room, what I have come across is that most of those problems can be sorted out in no time. As I, I say to you, people phone to say, we have a big, uh, in, in an area where we're traveling every day, we have a big pothole, nothing has been done about it. When I pick up the phone, phone the city manager of a particular municipality, in a day that is sorted out. Why shouldn't we work like that? Uh, people complain there's a best water pipe in our area. I pick up a phone call, speak to the relevant entity, or a People phone the hospital in this area. There's been a problem from morning. I pick up a phone, speak to the relevant of authority, and they solve the problem. What I have come across is that all these problems would be solved without new money. It's just because civil servants and government officials work in a way that treats ordinary people with disdain. So I've, I've, I've said as well that one of the things we will do We'll spend a lot of time on the ground. We're going to communities. We're interacting with government institutions where frontline services are provided to change the paradigm, the mentality uh, of uh, public servants to say, we are here to serve. Let's serve with uh, uh, people with commitment. Let's have uh, speed. There are things that can't wait for tomorrow. Uh, there are many areas where people have raised issues over a long time. Uh, they've been complaining that we need a speed hump in an area. Children die, they cross the road, uh, but it takes uh, 12, 12 months, if not five years. Uh, some of this don't involve lots of money. And, and I'm convinced, uh, Vuyo, that if we work that way, and we will work that way, that we are on the ground, go to a police station that's not functioning, hold the, the leadership of that institution accountable, go to a school that's poor performing, help them to turn it around, be in a government office that's delivering service but poor service, put pressure on those who are in charge, hold them accountable. We will achieve a lot. Uh, I, I am absolutely convinced that uh, we'll turn around uh, the public perceptions that government people are just there to serve their interests. Of course, in some instances, there's corruption. We also have to tackle it decisively. In the, in the state of the province address, I've said we must stop talking more about corruption and act more against corruption. But um, as provincial secretary of the ANC, you did have um, a lot of work to do. You did, in fact, have the powers to actually agitate for change. Um, and uh, the question, I guess, is why didn't you do that? Why didn't you get people to move with speed? Why didn't you get to people to talk uh, much, I mean, to do much, much more than they are talking when promising uh, um, our people things? We were transmitting at that time. We were transmitting the party line. We were transmitting the party program. We were not in a position to get to do those things. We relied, you know, that's what all you can do. When you are in an ANC office, you can only say the party wants you to do this. this you know, but the difference between then and now is a lot of things I used to deal with in the ANC office, people coming to complain, small business people saying we are not paid on time. I had to speak to the people who are in government. No, they will do it. Now I, I have to make sure it happens. That's what I'm doing now. I speak to the direct, I couldn't speak to government officials. If, if I, I wasn't, I, you know, when you are, when you are, I can't phone the DG of a department when there is a problem, poor service delivery and say, sort this out. I must phone the politician 
who is a member of the ANC deployed, who must then speak, now I'd go direct, I, I couldn't go to a hospital if there's poor service delivery and get the CEO to sort it out before. But now I can do that. I go to the hospital, sit down, or to a police station, sit down with the station commissioner and say, station commissioner, there are complaints here. What are you doing about this? Why is there no service delivery? I couldn't do that. You are, you, you, I could only complain about lack of action. And the, dis the difference is all the things uh, that I used to say this must be done have to be done by me and the team that is in government now. Uh, and I can tell you a lot of them can be done without major problems. Uh, and that helps uh, communities in the province uh, uh, to, to know that there are things we must do and there are things they must do. We don't want to create dependency, but government must do the things it needs to do. We want communities to rise to the occasion. They must do certain things as well. We need a partnership, uh, not a, a one-dimensional relationship. Uh, but I'm confident, Vuyo, the next uh, five years will be exciting. I mean, I've got the passion and energy. Uh, and uh, I know this province in and out. Uh, any, anywhere in the province where a, when a pro problem arises, I can already connect with where it originates uh, because I spend a lot of time in the ANC dealing with local problems. Premier, all I can say is best of luck. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Julio. Thank you. <laughs>